Okay, so chapter 12, here we're talking about antimicrobial treatments, specifically with things like medicines, you know, antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals. That's kind of what we're touching on here. So the goal of antimicrobial chemotherapy is to destroy the microbes but not harm the person. So let me define chemotherapy real quick. When people hear the term chemotherapy, they automatically, their mind jumps to like, you know, cancer treatment, but it, 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 it doesn't only refer to cancer treatment. Chemotherapy doesn't only refer to cancer treatment. It also refers to any time you take a drug, right? You take a drug to stop the growth of something inside, right? So if you take antibiotics, to stop bacterial infection, that's also considered chemotherapy. Does that make sense? So when we talk about antimicrobial chemotherapy, you can think of antibiotics, you can think of antifungals, this type of stuff. That's what we're talking about. And remember, the main point is to, because this is going to be in your body, right? When you take antibiotics, it's in your body. So you want to make sure that whatever drug you prescribe, whatever drug the patient is taking, it kills the microbe, but it does not harm you, right? Because what's the point of taking a drug if it harms you? You know, that's, that's problematic, right? So the best drugs harm the host, the, the patient, as little as possible while harming the pathogen, you know, the, the being toxic towards the pathogen. They should be microbiocidal rather than microbiostatic. Remember those suffixes? Cidal means kills. It should kill the microbe, not just stop it from growing. It should be soluble in the body fluid. That makes sense because it's going to be ingested. It should remain potent long enough to act and is not broken down or excreted prematurely. That makes sense. You don't want to just pee it out, you know, before it's had an effect on, you know, the microbe. And it should not cause antimicrobial resistance or it should cause as little antimicrobial resistance as possible, right? So these are good characteristics of an ideal drug. So the best drugs should have these characteristics, right? Are you going to spend the last part? The slow last part? Non yes, yeah, slow or non-existent development of antimicrobial resistance. So do, you've heard of drug-resistant bacteria? Yeah. You know, bacteria that are resistant to penicillin or resistant to methicillin. That's what we're talking about. Um, take, like, the best drugs are ones where it's difficult for the microbe to become resistant to it. Yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about. Okay. And we're just carrying on. It should help the host's defenses out like your immune system. When you see host's defenses, you should think your immune system. It should, it should complement your immune system. It should help your immune system, not conflict with your immune system, right? Not or compete with your immune system. It, it complements your immune system. It should remain active in the tissues and the body fluids because the longer the drug is active, the longer it's going to have a chance to have an effect on the microbe that's causing the infection, right? Readily delivered to the site of infection, that makes sense. You know, you want to make sure that the drug makes it to the site of the infection. And it shouldn't disrupt your health by causing allergies or causing other infections. Okay, that makes sense, right? You want, you want a good drug to have all these features. You want a good drug to have these characteristics. Okay.
Now, here's some terminology for us to understand if we're going to talk about drugs, just some terminology up front. Prophylaxis, this refers to the use of a drug to prevent an infection, an imminent infection of a person at risk. So you would take this ahead of time, right? You would take these drugs to prevent an infection of a person at risk. So think about if you're going to travel to a particular country, they may prescribe some prophylaxis, like malaria pills, et cetera, you know, because you're going to an area with a high amount of that particular disease. Antimicrobial chemotherapy. I told you what this is, right? Antimicrobial chemotherapy. This means taking medicine in the body to limit microbial growth. So antibiotics are the best example of antimicrobial chemotherapy, okay? Antibiotics, think antibiotics. Antimicrobials in general is an all-inclusive term for any antimicrobial drug. And antibiotics, like I said, antibiotics are an example of antimicrobial chemotherapy. These can inhibit or destroy bacteria, okay? This is something you definitely need to know that when people refer to antibiotics, these drugs kill or inhibit bacteria. Not archaea, not fungi, not viruses, not worms, not protozoa, not algae, but only bacteria, right? So antibiotics treat bacterial infections only. All right, more terminology for us. Now, drugs can be constructed in many different ways. There are what are known as synthetic drugs. These are drugs that are made in a lab. Okay, so these drugs were designed in a the lab. They're, they're synthesized in a lab. You don't find these drugs out in the wilderness. You don't find them out in nature. They were synthesized in a lab. That's why they're called synthetic. Then there's semi-synthetic drugs. This is a drug where it may have a natural origin, but it's been changed in order to make it more effective or more long-lasting, right? So it's a semi-synthetic drug, okay? It's a chemically modified drug. So for instance, you guys know penicillin? Well, penicillin is a natural antibiotic made by penicillium. The, the, fun, the fungus, right? Penicillium, remember? But penicillin has, you know, some drawbacks. It's, it's got, you know, it's easily digested by stomach enzymes. You know, it's got, it's, it's got a fragile ring called the beta-lactam ring that can be easily targeted by microorganisms. So guess what? Over the years, they figured out how to modify penicillin into other derivatives that are more robust, right? So there are many semi-synthetic versions of penicillin that they've made. But the original, the original penicillin was a naturally occurring antibiotic from a fungus. But humans have figured out how to modify that penicillin into semi-synthetic drugs that are called, you know, the penicillin family, right? Isn't that interesting? Now, when we're talking about narrow spectrum drugs or limited spectrum drugs, these are antimicrobials that only target a specific subset of microbes. So for instance, there might be a drug that only targets this class of microbes or let's say just gram negatives but not gram positives, right? Whereas a broad spectrum antimicrobial, this would be more broad, right? So if a, a, a drug that kills both gram negatives and gram positives would be a more broad spectrum drug than a drug that only kills, let's say, gram negatives. Do you agree, right? So some drugs are more narrow. Some drugs are more broad in what they are effective against. Okay. And where do antibiotics come from? Did you know antibiotics are actually common 
products of bacteria and fungi. Bacteria and fungi. I just told you that penicillium, which we've studied in the lab, remember it has the, the, the little finger-like projections of the conidiospores? That little fungus makes penicillin, right? But other antibiotics come from different fungi, a different bacterium. Bacteria can make antibiotics. But not all bacteria can make antibiotics. Let me share this with you. There are two main groups of bacteria that make antibiotics. Okay, one of them is bacillus. Bacillus, you guys know bacillus? And then the other one is called streptomyces. Streptomyces, let me write these down for you. Let's see if I have. You guys know bacillus, right? Huh? Any of these work? Uh, bacillus and streptomyces. Okay. Those are the two genuses which make antibiotics. So antibiotics are not a very common feature of all bacteria. Not all bacteria can make antibiotics. So for instance, let me ask you, do you think E. coli can make antibiotics? No, because E. coli is not a member of the bacillus genus, and it's not a member of the streptomyces genus either. Right. So just like endospores, remember endospores were mainly restricted to bacillus and clostridium. The ability to make antibiotics is restricted to mainly bacillus and streptomyces. Isn't that neat? So now you know not all bacteria can make antibiotics. Why do you think an, a bacteria would make an antibiotic? Why do you think that is? It's like resistance. What's resistant? Against whatever. Oh. Why would a bacteria make an antibiotic? Yeah. Yes. Is it a product, maybe, of the bacteria? It's a product of the bacteria, but, but antibiotics kill bacteria. Why would a bacteria make an antibiotic? Like, it's, like, it's like if a human made a human biotic and it kills humans. You know, <laughs> well, that would be weird, right? Like, yeah. That's, that's exactly right. Very good. So any bacteria that makes an antibiotic, mm -hmm. it makes that antibiotic, and it's resistant to that antibiotic. It's, but, it, but that antibiotic kills its competition. Right, exactly right. So, and that makes sense. Like, so let's say there's limited food. Well, guess what? If you make an antibiotic, you kill all your competitors, and you're the only one left standing to eat that food. You see, so it's a great way of, you know, destroying your competition, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so yeah, antibiotics are made by fungi. Antibiotics are made by bacteria, but mainly the bacteria in these two genuses. By the way, fun fact, streptomyces are found mainly in the soil. These are soil bacteria. Um, in fact, up to 20% of the microbes in soil are streptomyces. Did you know when it rains, for instance, you know, when it rains and then you go outside after it rains and you smell and you can tell it smells like moist earth, you know, that earthy smell? That's jasmine. That's a chemical that's secreted by these streptomyces. Isn't that neat? So those soil bacteria are making lots of antibiotics in the soil. Interesting. But like I said, those are, the, those are sources of antibiotics, but humans have figured out how to change those chemicals, you know, change those antibiotics to make them more long-lasting, resistant to stomach acid, you know, um, hard, harder to target and break down by resistant microbes. You know, so, those are, so we've made them into semi-synthetic drugs. And then there's a whole bunch of drugs that we've made just from scratch in the lab. Those are called synthetic drugs.
him. Oh, these are the streptomyces I just told you about. What's really neat about streptomyces, I may have mentioned this earlier in a previous chapter, is that this is a weird bacterium. This bacterium, it doesn't grow with the normal bacterial shape. You know, normal bacterial shape is caucus shape, bacillus shape, spirilla shape, right? This guy has a hyphal shape, a hyphal shape. What does hyphal mean? Filamentous. What else has a hyphal shape? Which organisms have a hyphal shape? Fungi. Fungi, yeah, very good. Molds, right? Molds have a hyphal shape, filamentous shape. Well, this bacteria has a filamentous shape, too. It's really weird. In fact, look at this. This is a colony of streptomyces, some, some genus, I mean, some, some species of streptomyces growing on a plate. How does that look to you? Kind of hard to tell, but if you look at it up close or uh, with a Quebec counter, you know, with the, it looks fuzzy. It looks like mold, doesn't it? Like if you saw that on your plate, you'd be like, I think I got mold on my plate, you know, mm -hmm. right? Because it actually, it has a fuzzy, velvety look, right? And it's weird because it trips people up all the time. They're like, oh, I got a fungal infection. I, I mean, a fungal a contamination on my plate. I got fungus. It's like, no, that's streptomyces. And the reason is it grows with a hyphal shape, so it forms a mycelium just like fungi do. Fungi have, you know, the molds have hyphal shapes, so they form mycelium. And that mycelium looks fuzzy on a plate when it forms a colony. Well, these bacteria form fuzzy colonies too. And so, you know, th so it's really interesting. Um, and I joke that streptomyces are funny because they, they have a, like an identity crisis. You know, they, they, they think they're fungi, right? Because <laughs> they look like fungi, they grow like fungi, they make antibiotics like fungi. You know, they even make asexual spores like fungi. Do you remember fungi make the little conidiospores and then, and then they form the spores and the spores disseminate, right? Streptomyces do the same thing. They form these little aerial hyphae, and at the tip of the aerial hyphae, they make little asexual spores. Not endospores, not endospores. Little asexual spores. And then those spores just, you know, disseminate in the air. So they really do think they're fungi, which is really weird, because they're not fungi, right? But they behave like fungi. Weird, right? And look. This is the source of so many different antibiotics, these streptomyces. You've probably heard of tetracycline. You've probably heard of streptomycin, vancomycin. Okay, Those are probably the ones you've, ivermectin. Right? These are all from streptomyces. <clears throat> Again, like I said, semi-synthetic drugs, <clears throat> these are modified versions of naturally occurring drugs. <clears throat> so for instance, original natural penicillin is made more effective against gram-negative bacteria and more resistant to host enzymes that inactivate it by adding different side chains to the molecule. That was one of the problems with penicillin. When they first came out with penicillin, when they first developed penicillin, there was a problem. When you give it to people, it would go down to the stomach, and the stomach has acid and enzymes, and that acid and that enzymes would totally neutralize the penicillin, and the penicillin would never make it into your body. So when they first developed penicillin, they would have to give you penicillin intravenously, right? Because that would bypass the harsh stomach, right? But then they figured out, oh, we could modify the penicillin. We could change it, and we could make it semi-synthetic in such a way that it, you know, the stomach acid doesn't just automatically neutralize it and people can take a pill. They don't have to go to the hospital and get an IV, right? Isn't that neat? So that's the point of making semi-synthetic drugs. You can make them better, longer lasting, less, you know, more resistant to anti, you know, products that the bacteria make that digest the, the drug. Okay. And like I said, synthetic drugs, these are completely manufactured in the lab. 
Okay. Um, which one? The, like, is synthetic more dangerous? It it it, it all depends on uh, it, it. All depends. There are there are natural drugs that are that can be dangerous or harmless. There are semi-synthetic drugs that could be dangerous or harmless, and there could be synthetic drugs that are dangerous or harmless. It all depends on the specific drug. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Okay. We can skip this one. Oh, actually, let's not skip this one. Um, now, before you start antimicrobial treatment, you need to know these three things. What's the microorganism that's causing the infection, right? Don't you want to know that? So if I go in and I have a bad infection in my arm, well, what is that infection? Like, is it a, a gram-positive bacteria? Is it a gram-negative bacteria? Is it a bacteria at all? Is it fungi? You know, we kind of need to know these things, right? And so a lot of times, if they do it properly, they'll take a little sample, right, of the infection, and they'll culture it in the lab. And when they culture it, they can do exactly what we're doing this week in the lab, which is the unknown identification, you know? So, you know, the clinic has access to labs, labs that can do unknown identification. And so if you reach, if, you know, if I have strep throat, if I have a throat infection, we can take a swab of that. If I have an infection in my arm, we could take a swab of that. We can send it to the lab. They could identify it. They can say, well, this is a Staphylococcus aureus infection. And, you know, and so that's important to do, especially if you've tried one round of antibiotics and it didn't do anything. You know, now we need to figure out why. You know, what, 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 do, we need to, what do we need to prescribe? The degree of the microorganism susceptibility. So we did the Kirby-Bauer test, right? Are all microorganisms equally susceptible to all antibiotics? No. E. coli might be more susceptible to these. The reason you would collect a specimen from an infection on a patient is because you want to send it to the lab, have them identify the bacterium, have them do a Kirby-Bauer test report back, because now you're going to know, if I prescribe this antibiotic, it's going to be effective, right? It's going to, it should treat the infection, you see? So that's much better than just guessing and randomly, you know, prescribing some antibiotic that may or may not be effective. And remember how we do this, we, we measure the zone of inhibition in millimeters, right, metric, and then we compare it to a table like this. This is one of those interpretation charts. And then we determine, well, if the zone of inhibition is bigger than this diameter, it's susceptible. If it's smaller than that, you know, it's either intermediate or resistant. Now, here's some more terminology for you. The minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC. This is the smallest concentration of drug that's still effective, that still inhibits growth. Okay. So that's the minimum concentration that you should prescribe in order to have an effect. Mm -hmm. Let's skip this slide. Now here's some more important terminology for you. It's this terminology of therapeutic index and therapeutic ratio. The therapeutic index refers to the ratio of the dose of the drug that is toxic to humans to its effective dose. So let me, let me delve into this a little bit more and explain what that means. The effective dose, the effective dose is the concentration that must be prescribed to have an effect. To cause, to cause the microbe to, you know, be inhibited, right? And the toxic dose is the concentration that becomes toxic to you, okay? So what do you think? Good drugs, good drugs 
should have a big ratio. They should have a big difference between the effective dose and the toxic dose. So, for example, what if, what if 10 micrograms of a drug, what if 10 micrograms of a drug is the effective dose, but 11 micrograms is the toxic dose? That's not a good drug, right? Because it's like a 1.1 ratio. Does that make sense? So that would be a pretty bad drug. <laughs> I, that would not be my go-to drug for treating people. One that has an effective dose at 10, but a toxic dose at 11, that's way too close. That's way too close, right? But what about a ratio or an, a therapeutic index of 10? What that means is the effective dose, let's say it's one milligram, right? But the toxic dose is 10 milligrams. Is that a better drug? That's a better drug. That has a TI of 10, a therapeutic index of 10. It's a 1 to 10 ratio. Does that make sense? The best drugs have a bigger therapeutic index. The best drugs have a bigger therapeutic index. That means the ratio between the effective dose and the toxic dose is big. And especially for some patients. Some patients, you know, they're older. They can be forgetful, right? And what if you prescribe something that's, you know, effective at one milligram, but very toxic at two, right? Well, you know, everyone, you know, even me, I forget sometimes. I'm like, did I take my pill this morning? Did I not take my pill this morning? And you might end up taking two pills, right? Well, if two milligrams is super toxic and you're forgetful and you take two that day, well, now you're in the hospital. That's not good. But if one milligram is effective, 10 is toxic, what are the odds that you're just going to have 10 pills in one day accidentally? Not that much. So that's a much better drug to prescribe. You see? So again, the therapeutic index is the difference between the therapeutic dose or the effective dose and the toxic dose. The bigger that difference is, the better that drug is considered, right? And that makes sense because it's, you can't just accidentally overdose on those drugs, you know. And, that, and this gets into this topic of selective toxicity. The best drugs are selectively toxic. They kill or inhibit the microbe without simultaneously damaging the host. So these are the ones with the high TI. These are the drugs with the high therapeutic index, aren't they? The, therapeutic, the selective toxicity drugs. This means that they're very deadly against the bacteria, but not against your cells. They don't damage your cells as much. So penicillin is a great example. Penicillin is known for having a very large therapeutic index. It's great at killing microorganisms, but it doesn't harm people, unless the people are allergic. But that's not due to the toxicity of the penicillin. It's due to an allergic reaction. There's a difference. Right. And it makes sense. You know why? I think I mentioned earlier uh, in a previous chapter, I mentioned what penicillin targets, didn't I? What does penicillin target? The cell wall. Peptidoglycan cell walls. Do we have a peptidoglycan cell wall? No. Do we have any cell walls? No, right? So if we don't have a cell wall, well then, that's great. It's something that targets a cell wall is most likely not going to have any bad effect on us, right? Does that make sense? You guys follow me? Because you guys know what drugs are for the most part? Most drugs are just little tiny molecules, small molecules that bind to and inhibit some enzyme or some protein, right? That's all most drugs are a small molecule that binds to and inhibits some protein or enzyme. Okay, and if 
if the penicillin is targeting a protein and you don't have any kind of analogous protein, you don't have a protein that looks anything like it in your body, well then there's probably not going to be much crosstalk, right? There's not a chance that that drug is going to inadvertently bind to one of your proteins and block its function, right? Does that make sense? Because a lot of times you heard of side effects. Side effects are caused by drugs binding to targets other than the one they're designed to target, right? So for instance, what if we have a drug that targets ribosomes, bacterial ribosomes? Yeah? Do we also have ribosome? Yeah. So that's a little riskier. That's a little, you know, you know, because it might, who knows, it might stick to your ribosomes. And now you may have problems in your own cells, right? Because the, the drug is supposed to stick to the bacterial ribosomes. But if it kind of sticks to your ribosomes, now you have a side effect. Now it's affecting you, right? Why? Because you both have ribosomes, right? And the drug that messes with its ribosomes might mess with your ribosomes, right? But if, if penicillin's targeting a cell wall, and you don't even have anything like a cell wall, well, it's way less likely that that drug is just going to randomly stick to something else in your body because you don't even have something analogous, right? Does that make sense? So as a rule of thumb, the more different the, more different the target is than you the more likely there are to be selective drugs for that target, right? All right. And what are these targets? I said, you know, these antibiotics have targets. I said that one of the targets is the cell wall. So penicillin would be an example of a chemotherapeutic agent that targets the cell wall. But some antibiotics target DNA and RNA synthesis. Some inhibit protein synthesis, you know, by targeting the ribosomes, like I just said. Some can interfere with the membrane. Some can even interfere with folic acid synthesis or some other metabolic pathway. So these right here, you see what's listed here? These are the targets of antibiotics. These are the targets of antibiotics. Antibiotics, different classes of antibiotics target these different structural components of bacteria, right? So which class does penicillin belong to again? The cell wall. Yeah, it targets the cell wall. And in fact, there's a whole list, there's a whole list of a antibiotics that target the cell wall, including, you know, vancomycin and methicillin you may have heard of and penicillin, so all target the cell wall, right? And then just like that, there's also a whole list of antibiotics that target DNA or RNA synthesis, right? There's also a whole list of antibiotics uh, that target the ribosome. There's a whole list that target this. If, have you ever heard of sulfa drugs or sulfonamides? They target folic acid synthesis, right? So when you are prescribed an antibiotic, you could look up which one of these structural components or cell functions is it messing with, right? Those cones have a side effect of pneumonia? These, yeah, very good, very good, yeah. So these two here are most likely to have human side effects, to be antibiotics with side effects, uh, with lower TI, lower toxic uh, index, uh, or sorry, therapeutic index, lower th therapeutic index. Because how do, you, how do you block DNA and RNA synthesis? Don't you have to block DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase? Yeah, and the problem is we also have a DNA polymerase and an RNA polymerase, and if it crosstalks at all with our DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase, now our cells suffer, you know? 
And yes, it's true. Several of these drugs do have pretty low therapeutic index. And they're usually only prescribed if some other drug is not effective, right? So let's say you have a really, really um, persistent infection, and they've already tried penicillin. They've already tried some other drugs. Then they might delve into these drugs with a lower TI because maybe it's not as resistant to those drugs, right? But it's usually not their first, you know, go-to drug. Yeah, yeah. These don't tend to be go-to drugs, right? The cell wall synthesis inhibitors tend to be the go-to drugs, yeah, because they tend to have a nicer selective toxicity. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So again, you can see these. This is a bacterial cell depicted, a bacterial cell. And you can see the different targets for the antibiotics. Let's talk about the cell wall. Look at the cell wall of peptidoglycan. All of these antibiotics disrupt the cell wall. See, penicillins. I'll just name some off. Vancomycin, uh, Bessitracin, Cephalosporins, right? If you've heard of any of these, these are cell wall inhibitors. And they're most likely to have a nice big therapeutic index. Right? But then you have uh, drugs that target the plasma membrane, polymyxins, for instance. You have drugs that target DNA or RNA synthesis, quinolones, rifampin. In fact, quinolones are, you know, shied away from these days. They can cause all kinds of problems in people. But like I said, that's because these are structures that are similar to structures we have. So there's most likely to have adverse reactions, right? Um, folic acid synthesis. I said these are the sulfa drugs, sulfonamides. And what about, the, what about drugs that target the ribosome? That means that you're going to prevent the, the bacteria from making proteins, right? If you target the ribosome, well, then you're going to target protein synthesis, right? So there are some drugs that target the large subunit. Remember, the ribosome has a large hamburger bun and a small hamburger bun, the large subunit and the small subunit. These drugs target the large subunit. These drugs target the small subunit. Um, and then this one targets both. So you see, that's all drugs are for the most part. Drugs are these small molecules that come here, like for instance, these small molecules that bind to targets like a ribosome. And it gums up the works. It's like throwing a monkey wrench into a machine. It's going to clog up the machine. Drugs bind to these machines, these enzymes or these organelles, and they prevent them from doing their job, right? And when you do that, then the cell can no longer function correctly, and it will either stop growing, that's a static agent, or it will die, that's a cytal agent, right? But that's all drugs are. Isn't that interesting? And you're just hoping when you take a drug, right, when you take a drug, you're hoping that that little molecule goes and binds nicely to the bacteria target, the bacterial target, but it does not just drift into one of your cells and find a target there. You see what I'm saying? So, for instance, if I take a quinolone, if I take a quinolone because I want to target, what is it? DNA gyrase of the bacteria, but it finds some off target, some off target protein that it happens to bind to in my heart, it could stop my heart, right? And then I suddenly have a heart attack and I die, right? You know? But that's because this little drug bound to a heart protein in me. Should it bind to a heart protein in me? No. But it just happened to, and that gives me a terrible side effect. Does that make sense? So that's what side effects tend to be, actually. That's how side effects work. You take a drug 
that's meant to have some very specific target, but it has an off-target effect. It binds to, let's say, a brain protein, a protein that's in my neurons of my brain. Then I get a seizure. Suddenly I have a seizure because I'm taking this drug. But it's because instead of just, instead of just targeting the target, it's stuck to one of my important brain proteins, you know, or brain enzymes, you know. Uh, that's how side effects work, basically. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So the more different the target is than anything that's in your body, the more likely it is to have no side effects. Right? Isn't that interesting? Now, some of these drugs, even even if they're not, um, even if they're not toxic, they can cause allergies, you know, or or trigger allergies, I should say. So you have to be careful with that. See, some some drugs have allergic reactions. Some people are allergic to penicillin, for instance. They can also have other off-target effects, like they could disrupt the balance of the normal microbiota. Do you guys remember? Um, one of the problems with taking antibiotics all the time is that not only does it kill the, the bacteria that's causing your infection, but it also kills all your healthy bacterium too, like your gut bacterium and all your healthy bacterium as well. So you have to also weigh that as a, as a drawback of taking antibiotics. It's not harmless to take antibiotics. You are disrupting your normal micro, microbial uh, flora. You're disrupting those organisms that are supposed to grow in these different niches on, in your body, right? And like I said, sometimes they can even cause toxicity. Some of these drugs can damage your tissues due to toxicity. Okay, here are some of those, here are some of those, uh, some of the types of damage or abnormalities that can be produced by different drugs. You know, obviously you don't need to memorize these, but just be aware that, you know, there's no perfect drug. There's no perfect drug. There's no perfect drug for everyone. Penicillin might be a perfect drug for me because it works great, you know, in me and I, and it's, I'm not toxic, it's not toxic to me, but you might take penicillin, you might have a really bad allergic reaction to it. So, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect drug for everybody. You know, you need to, you know, take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Antifungals, antiprotozoans. So again, there are drugs for every type of infection, right? If you're, if you, if you have a, ant, if you have a fungal infection, you don't want to take an antibiotic, right? Because remember, what are the only organisms killed by antibiotics? Bacterium, right? That's it. If I have a fungal infection, I can't take a antibiotic. I need to take an antifungal, right? If I have a protozoan infection, if I have like plasmodium, or if I have trypanosoma infection, well then I need to take an antiprotozoan. All of these drugs have specific targets, and those targets are usually one particular enzyme or one particular protein or the ribosome, you know? They target one particular thing. So if, if your infection doesn't have that particular target, that drug's useless, right? Uh, that drug, if, it, if it's targeting something that's not in your infection. Anti-helminths, right? So there are, there are medicines for worm infections and antivirals. So we're going to talk about antivirals in a little bit. But with antivirals, what you should know is that Usually antivirals, all they can usually do is slow down the infection, slow it down. And by slowing it down, it can give your body a chance to cure yourself, to, to clear the infection, right? But unfortunately, usually, if your body can't cure yourself, it'll just become a chronic infection, right? That's only made better, you know, it's made better with these drugs, but not cured, okay, for the most part, okay? And like I said, 
drugs can have toxic effects, you know. They could damage the liver, kidneys, GI tract, you name it. Okay. But not all, not all uh, of these toxic side effects affect everyone in the same way. You know, some people may have much more adverse side effects than other people. Um, you could take, for instance, you could take a drug and lose all your teeth. You know, and someone else may take the drug and it's just fine, right? Uh, it just happened to be really, your body really took that drug the wrong way, you know, and it just happened to be very toxic to you. And you know why drugs can be very toxic to some people and not other people? It's because all of us have gen different genetics, right? Different genetic backgrounds. Because again, what are, what are drugs? Just small molecules that stick to things right? Stick to targets. Well, what are those targets? Those targets are proteins usually, right? The targets of drugs are usually proteins. And what dictates how a protein is made? You know, uh, DNA. Your DNA, your genes. Don't all of us have different genes? Yeah. I have different genes. You have different genes, right? So when I make hemoglobin protein, I make it in a certain way, right? Um, but guess what? You might make your hemoglobin protein a slightly different. You might have sickle cell, where your hemoglobin protein folds a different way, and now you have sickle cell, right? Well, that means my hemoglobin protein might look different than your hemoglobin protein, right? It's both hemoglobin protein, but mine looks different than yours. Well, what if, what if Yours just happens to fold in a way that binds to one of these drugs. Now you're going to have issues, right? Does that make sense? Because that drug shouldn't bind to hemoglobin. But because of how your hemoglobin happens to fold, it just happens to bind nicely to this drug, <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? So now you're going to have a, a, some kind of blood problem. You're going to have some kind of anemia by taking this, this uh, drug. I'm not going to have that anemia because that drug doesn't bind to my hemoglobin. It binds to your hemoglobin, right? Does that make sense? So that's why you hear like, oh, there are side effects for this drug. It's like, yeah, but I take this drug, I'm fine. There's no side effect. Well, it's, it's because do you have that structure? Do you have, you know, everyone's going to react to drugs differently. You're like, I might take a drug and it's great and I'm fine. You might take it and literally drop dead. You know what I mean? That could happen. That's what they call in those commercials at the end. It's like, my acne's never been better. Use actin, you know, <laughs> anti-actin, ace. You know, and then there's like, may cause sudden death and, you know, <laughs> you know, at the end of the commercial, right? Why do you think it says that at the end of the commercial? It's because, well, in some subset of people with certain genetic backgrounds, yeah, it could bind to an important heart enzyme and, you know, you, you, you just had a sudden heart attack and death. Yeah. Is that the size of a person? Uh, no, no, it's your genetics. And there's no real way to know, unfortunately. So anytime you take a drug, there is a possibility that you could have a side effect. You know, not, not drop dead side effect, you know, but you might get fatigue. You might get, you know, some kind of constipation. You might get seizures. I don't know. It, it, it could happen. It's just based on your background. And usually those common, the common side effects are listed. The common side effects are listed for particular drugs, and those common side effects are based on what happened to other people with certain genetics, you know, you know, and such. So you always have to be careful anytime you're taking a new drug, you know, to make sure there aren't any bad side effects. But now you know kind of what causes those side effects. The the drug is targeting something other than what it's meant to, right? That's what's happening there. Okay. And again, drugs can act as antigens that stimulate an allergic response. You know, it's, it's just like any other allergy. You know, you could have a peanut allergy where some people eat peanuts and they really enjoy themselves, and then other people eat peanuts and they die, right? Uh, same thing with drugs. You know, uh, you could take, I could take penicillin and it treated my infection. You could take penicillin and have a really bad anaphylactic shock al allergic reaction and die. 
right? It's, uh, it, drugs are no different than any antigen. They can trigger, you know, these allergies, you know, and if it's a bad enough allergy, it could lead to death. Penicillins, to, unfortunately, even though it's a great drug, that has the most number of people with allergies against it. Up to, like, I, I think I read somewhere around 5% of the population is allergic to penicillin. So that's quite a few people. Followed by sulfonamides. Remember, sulfonamides are the folic acid inhibitor. So again, remember, when you take when you take antibiotics, you have to be careful because it might affect your normal microbiota, right? Your normal gut flora, for instance. Your normal, uh, what are called your resident microbes. And that can cause a problem because now you've freed up real estate for more nefarious microbes to grow. I think I told you guys about C. diff. Clostridium difficile. When you take antibiotics, you can kill your healthy gut microbes, your healthy probiotics. And now this Clostridium, which can make endospores and produce a toxin that really, really irritates your colon. You know, now it's growing in the intestines and it's taking over that real estate. You know, it, it wouldn't have a chance to take over that real estate if you didn't kill all those microbes that were taking up that space on the lumen in the, in the gut lining, right? But because you took so much antibiotics, a lot of those bacterium that line your guts died and sloughed off of your intestines, freeing up that lining real estate these microbes attach and they start dividing. They start growing and they take over. And that's not what you want because now this is a microbe that produces a toxin, a toxin that results in colitis. Colitis is inflammation and bleeding of the colon and a lot of pain associated with that, right? So you just have to be worried about super infection. It's a complication called super infection. So recall there are broad spectrum drugs and narrow spectrum drugs. This all depends on how many different classes of germs are killed by a particular agent. Tetracyclines are, an, are a good example of a broad spectrum drug, while penicillin is actually an example of a more narrow spectrum drug. Here you can see narrow spectrum drugs have a small band, while broad spectrum drugs have a large band on this graphic here. And let me show you why. So again, tetracycline, which is this dark orange bar here, it affects gram-negative bacterium, gram-positive bacterium, chlamydias, which are intracellular and rickettsias, which are intracellular bacterium as well. So you have all this range of microbes, that, of bacterium that you can destroy with tetracyclines. Whereas if we're just talking about penicillins, it's mostly effective against gram-positive bacteria with some you know, overlap into the other areas as well. But it's more for gram-positive bacterium. Right, so if you have a staph infection, penicillin would be good because staph aureus is a gram-positive bacterium. But if you have a gram-negative infection, well then penicillin wouldn't be the best bet. Again, speaking of penicillins, there's a whole class of penicillins. All of these are considered penicillins and these target the cell wall. Remember, that's how penicillin works. It targets the peptidoglycan cell wall, and it compromises the cell wall, and that leads to the cell lysing due to osmotic stress, due to water rushing into the cell and lysing the cell. And, it's, and it makes sense then if you think about, well, it's the gram positives with the large cell wall of peptidoglycan, so 
penicillin should be more effective against these guys because they have a larger cell wall. And this is what those penicillins look like. See, they have a common structure. These are all different penicillins. Notice how they all have a common structure. It's this ring uh, called the beta lactam ring. Next to it is another ring, the thiazolidine ring. They all have a beta lactam ring. You see this, this beta lactam ring? It's a ring, it looks like a box. It's a ring that looks like a box. And then they have these side chains on here or R groups. The reason I want to point out this box, you see this beta lactam ring, is because that's the target of uh, the, the uh, resistance protein that bacterium make. You know that some bacterium are resistant to penicillin, right? Well, those bacterium that are resistant to penicillin, those bacterium have a gene called penicillin ACE, which makes an enzyme called penicillin ACE. And guess what penicillin ACE attacks? It attacks that beta lactam ring right there, right? So it actually cleaves that ring. So when, whenever you hear penicillin resistant bacterium, think this bacterium makes an enzyme that cuts penicillin right there, right at the beta lactam ring. And that's not good, right? Because if you cleave penicillin, what can penicillin not do? It can't do its function anymore, right? It can't wear down the cell wall, right? Inhibit the cell wall. Okay, so that's interesting. We should know that penicillins target the cell wall. We should know that penicillins have this beta lactam ring structure, and that's the target of what? Penicillinase, those penicillin resistant bacterium. Okay. In fact, all of these are different penicillins. Penicillins G and V are most important natural forms. These are the natural forms used to treat, uh, treat gram-positive cocci and some gram-negative bacterium, some of them. But remember, these are the natural, the natural drugs, right? From what? Remember the mold penicillium makes these. Now look at this. There's other penicillins as well. There's ampicillin, carbinicillin, amoxicillin. These have a more broad spectra of action. They can kill even more of a range of different organisms, not just mainly the gram positives. Why? Because we've made them semi-synthetic. Remember, we've modified the, the, the structure. And now it can be used against gram-negative enteric rods as well, like E. coli, salmonella, like the family of your unknown. You know the, the family of your unknown? Remember is enterobacteria ECE? Remember that big long word I wrote? Those are the enteric rods, right? So ampicillin, carbidicillin, amoxicillin would actually be effective against those gut bacteria, right, those rods. Then you probably heard of methicillin. Right? Methicillin, as well as these other guys here, but methicillin is the most used. Methicillin is useful in treating infections caused by some, what is this, penicillinase producing bacterium. Remember, penicillinase is the enzyme that cleaves the beta lactam ring, right? Well, guess, guess what? They made methicillin so that its, its beta lactam ring is resistant is it, its beta lactam ring can't be destroyed by penicillinase. That's pretty good. So if you find a penicillin resistant microbe, you could try methicillin instead because that penicillinase can't cleave methicillin the way it can regular penicillin's beta lactam ring. That's kind of neat. But nowadays, unfortunately, some bacterium are becoming methicillin resistant. That's really tragic, right? It's because this was our answer to penicillinase, 
Well, guess what? Now they've adapted even more and they're methicillin resistant now too, right? So that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> um, in fact, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest plagues we have right now in the medical setting is what's called MRSA. Have you guys heard of MRSA, M-R-S-A? That's methicillin resistant staph aureus. You know, and that's a big pain because, you know, we, we know staph lives on your skin. Staph aureus can get in and cause abscesses. It can cause skin infections, right? And normally, we just give you penicillin and you're good, right? Or if it's resistant to penicillin, we give you methicillin and you're good. But now with MRSA, we can't, you know, give you methicillin. We need to try other drugs as well. And so it's very difficult to treat MRSA. And this is why, you know, in the clinic, it says, watch out for MRSA, wash your hands, keep your skin clean, you know, cover up, cover up any cuts and things like that. And then also clovanic acid inhibits beta lactamase enzymes and is added to penicillins to increase their effectiveness in the presence of penicillinase producing bacteria. So that's kind of nice. We add this so that it kind of inhibits penicillinase. So when we add penicillin, when we add clovanic acid plus penicillin, it has, it still has, retains its effect. It doesn't get neutralized by the enzymes, the penicillinase enzyme. Okay. Cephalosporins, you may have heard of these as well. It's another uh, drug that targets the cell wall. It's a natural product isolated from this organism. These have a beta lactam ring that can be synthetically altered. Okay. And there's other drugs that target the cell wall too, not just the penicillins. There's other drugs as well. Bacitracin, vancomycin, you guys have probably heard of vancomycin, that's another very common drug. In fact, what's really tragic is back in the day, like 30 years ago, vancomycin was known as the drug of last resort, right? When nothing else would work, they would bust out vancomycin and it usually worked, right? That was our drug of last resort, right? But unfortunately, over the last 30 years, microbes have gotten even resistant to this. So now, if you go into the clinic, you may hear not only are, are they scared of MRSA, but they're scared of VERSA as well. Vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. It's getting worse. You know, microbial drug resistance is getting worse. Microbes used to be easily killed with just penicillin 30, 40 years ago. But nowadays, you try penicillin, doesn't work. Try methicillin, doesn't work. Try vancomycin, doesn't work. You know, like the Kirby Bauer test? Like, imagine a Kirby Bauer test where there's no halos. There's no zone of inhibition anyway. You know, with, you, do, you do a whole thing. And that's the scary future is, you know, the microbes are getting more and more and more resistant. And this is due to overuse of uh, antibiotics and adaptation from the microbes. The microbes adapt. We overuse the antibiotics, and those are as a deadly combination, right? So. Okay. And again, um, I said these three are examples of cell wall inhibitors. Vancomycin is very interesting. It's narrow spectrum. It, it's very useful against susceptible staph infections. In the case where penicillin and methicillin, you know, resistance is happening, or if a patient is allergic to penicillin, right? Remember that around 5% of the population is, is re, uh, allergic to penicillin. Well, in that case, you may want to try vancomycin. Now moving on, remember I said there are four main targets of drugs action, right? The cell wall is just one of them. Now we're moving on to protein synthesis. 
drugs that inhibit protein synthesis. So which organelle do you think these drugs mainly inhibit? Which organelle? The ribosomes. Yeah, exactly right. The ribosomes. Because the ribosomes make proteins. These are drugs that stop protein synthesis. So these drugs typically, they either bind to the large subunit of the ribosome, the small subunit of the ribosome, or something like that. They, but they interact, they disrupt the ribosome from doing its job, right? You may have heard of streptomyces. You remember I talked to you about streptomyces. Those are the soil bacterium. They are known for making a wide array of these uh, protein synthesis inhibitors. Okay. In fact, streptomycin is an antibiotic from streptomyces. Right? Remember those soil bacterium. So take a look here. This organelle is obviously the ribosome, right? Remember the ribosome looks like, I, I call it a hamburger bun, right? You've got the large hamburger bun, you've got the small hamburger bun. In bacterium, in bacterium, the, the ribosome is a different than our, our ribosomes, aren't they, right? In, in bacterium, you have what's known as the 70S ribosome because you have a 50S large subunit and a 30S small subunit. I know that doesn't add to 70, but it's still together they're called the 70S ribosome. You and I have what's called the 80S ribosome. Our ribosomes are slightly bigger, right? So, you know, in case you're wondering why doesn't it stop our ribosomes too? Well, our ribosomes are slightly different looking than bacterial. Now, the problem is what ribosomes do our mitochondria have? They have the 70S ribosome. So unfortunately, sometimes you can have side effects where what's happening? You're taking these tetracyclines and stuff. You're taking these, these drugs. And what, what is it blocking? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, your mitochondrial ribosomes in addition to the bacterial ribosomes. That's not good, because don't you kind of need your ribosomes to function? You know what I mean? So that's a thing. You know, so, so sometimes tetracyclines can be kind of scary if they cause side effects in you. You know, they can cause side effects. And, and again, now you can see why they cause side effects. Well, because you have mitochondrial ribosomes, which look like bacterial ribosomes. The, the drug might interact with both, you know, and that's not good. That's not good. So here you can see a list of different antibiotics, see? Different antibiotics and what they target. This one targets the large subunit. This, uh, this one targets the small subunit. This one targets the large subunit. You know, this one, the tetracycline looks like it's targeting transferase or something. You know, something with the, with the with progression of the tRNAs. Erythromycin, it's actually binding, it looks like, to the mRNA. But either way, notice what these small drugs are doing. They're interfering with the normal function of the ribosome, right? And if you don't let the ribosome do its job, well, then it's going to do what? It's going to stop making proteins. And then it's going to be at least bacteriostatic, right? Bacteriostatic meaning prevent the bacteria from growing. It could even be bactericidal. It could even cause the bacteria to die, but most likely stop growing. Again, tetracyclines are a major class of what I'm talking about, protein synthesis inhibitors, right? The reason they're called tetracyclines is because the molecule has four rings. You find these from streptomyces. Remember the soil bacterium that grow like, like moldy? They, they grow like mold. And again, I told you, they bind to the ribosomes. They stop the protein synthesis, right? And now, does it make sense why 
These are effective against a broad range of different bacteria. Well, most bacteria have ribosomes, right? So, you know, any bacteria that has ribosomes should be susceptible, at least a little, to tetracycline. Okay. Next, now we're moving on from, we talked about cell wall inhibitors like the penicillins and vancomycin. Then we talked about the protein synthesis inhibitors with tetracycline. Now we're moving on to folic acid inhibitors. Folic acid synthesis inhibition. So what this type of drugs do, it's, they're called sulfa drugs or sulfonamides. Yes? What's the function of folic acid in your body? In your body? Yeah, and in bacterium. Folic acid, that's a good question. Folic acid is a precursor of nucleotides, right? So synthesizing A's, G's, C's, and T's, and U's, right? Making nucleic acids. So if you can't make folic acid, you can't make DNA, you can't make RNA, because you can't make nucleotides, which are the building blocks of DNA and RNA, right? So that's, that's something you want to target, right? So, bacteria. So, both men and yeah. women, they take folic acid. They're supposed to take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it's women. Really well, I mean, if you're deficient, you, you don't have to take anything unless you're deficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're deficient, you should take supplements. Yeah. So if every human should be on folic acid. Especially if you're deficient or if you're in, in you know, danger of being deficient based on a health concern. Yeah. Yeah, so it all depends. It depends. So yeah, again, microorganisms also need folic acid. They, they synthesize folic acid. So what the sulfa drugs do, what the sulfonamides do, is they prevent the microorganism from making uh, folic acid. And that would limit its growth, right? It would prevent it from growing. And the way it works is by kind of competing. They, they interfere with the folate met metabolism by blocking the enzymes required for synthesis of tetrahydrofluorate. So basically, how it works is like this. They mimic a substrate. They mimic a substrate of the enzyme that makes folic acid. So the sulfa drug mimics, what is it called? It's not written here. I could bring it up. Let me, let me bring it up, actually. I'll show you the whole mechanism. Sulfa drug action. OK, let me show you this. It's kind of neat. I'm trying to find a simple one for you. This one might be good. Let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. Paba. Yes. There we go. So to make folic acid, your cells use PABA, this molecule. They take this molecule and they use that to make folic acid. Does that make sense? All right. You need PABA to make folic acid. The sulfa drug looks like this. What can you tell me about how the sulfa drug looks? It mimics PABA, right? It kind of looks like PABA, right? So it tricks the bacteria in using the sulfa drug to make the folic acid with the sulfa drug 
instead of the pub, right? Now, if you use this sulfa drug to make folic acid, have you truly made folic acid or have you made an imposter? You've made an imposter, yeah. So, because you use this molecule to try to make folic acid, well, guess what? Now you can't use that to make DNA or RNA, right? You, it comp it's a it's a competitive inhibitor, right? It's a it's it competes with the true substrate. Does that make sense? And now you're not making nearly as many correct nucleotides. Now everything's gummed up. It's not working correctly. So, by mimicking a substrate of making this molecule here. You're blocking the synthesis of folic acid production, right? Does that make sense? But what do you need to know? You need to know that sulfa drugs or sulfonamides, they prevent the synthesis of folic acid, right? And that causes the microorganisms to stop growing. Next target, moving on to another target. Some drugs target DNA synthesis and RNA synthesis directly, not by, not by blocking folic acid production, but directly blocking the, the replication of the DNA or the RNA. Okay? If this is true, what enzymes could you be inhibiting? How about DNA polymerase? How about RNA polymerase? How about helicase? What does helicase do? Who remembers? Unwraps. Unwraps or unwinds the DNA. Remember, helicase unzips the DNA. It unwinds the DNA. If I inhibit helicase, is my DNA going to get unwound and copied? No, I can't copy my DNA because I can't even unwind it, right? Does that make sense? If I inhibit DNA polymerase, am I going to copy my DNA? No. If I inhibit RNA polymerase, am I going to copy DNA to RNA? No. How about gyrase? What does gyrase do? Or gyrase, also known as, uh, 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 not topoisomer. Yeah, topoisomerase. Topoisomerase or gyrase. What, is that? what does that do? It, it allows you to copy the DNA by, by cutting unswiveling and then reconnecting the DNA to relieve torsional stress. Remember that? So what are the targets? What are the targets of these DNA and RNA inhibitors? The targets are these important enzymes that unwind DNA, copy DNA, copy RNA, right? So if those are the targets, then you're not going to grow, right? Because you can't copy your DNA. You can't transcribe your genes to mRNA, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then there's one more target I want to talk about. Cell membranes, right? Some drugs can target the cell membrane itself, not the cell wall, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane of the cell. For example, polymyxins. Polymyxins, a narrow spectrum uh, peptide antibiotic with a unique fatty acid component that contributes to their detergent activity. It can get in there and disrupt the cell membrane of bacterium. Okay, but it has side effects, right? It can be toxic to the kidney. So probably they'll use this if nothing else seems to work, right? Okay. Cool, cool. All right. Now, do you think if microorganisms are found in a biofilm, does that maybe complicate things a little bit if you're trying to it, it, you know, treat the infection, yes. Because remember, the biofilm is this sugary, proteinaceous goo that, you know, there's a whole community of different microorganisms growing in this sugar, right? So think about it. If I have a drug and that drug needs to get into all the cells to affect the cells, 
well, that drug might get all stuck in the biofilm, in the sugar of the biofilm, and never penetrate the biofilm to get into where the bacteria are underneath. Does that make sense? So it's almost like a force field, like a, like a protective shield of goo, you know, and all these antibiotics can't penetrate the goo to get inside to where all the microorganisms are. So bi biofilms are, you know, bad news when you're trying to use antibiotics when you're trying to treat an infection. This was particularly bad back in the days of early implants, you know. We're talking back in the 80s, 90s, you know, some of the earlier implants that they would do, heart devices, limbs, you know, like when they would put new shoulder, new knee, new hip, you know. Some of those early materials they used, they were prone to getting infected. And then the bacteria, imagine you get a new hip, with, and it's a steel ball, and then the bacteria grow on there and they make a biofilm. Now you're in trouble because they could give you antibiotics, but it won't penetrate that biofilm on your new hip, right? So that was a big problem. Nowadays, we have better technology, better, better materials that are more biofilm resistant, better techniques to prevent contamination in the first place. So it's less, you don't hear about it as much anymore, but when I was a kid, you would hear about people getting joint replacement and then it's infected. Then they have to go back in surgery, open it back up, clean it up. I mean, it was a mess. So you, you, you would just really, really hope you didn't get an infection after a joint replacement. But anyway, nowadays we don't have to worry so much about biofilms inside of our body. But, you know, you guys know that you form biofilms on your teeth. That's the form of plaque. And you can't just treat your teeth with chemicals and clean your teeth that way, right? You have to physically scrub the plaque off. And again, why? Because of how tough biofilms are and how resistant they are to chemicals. So antibiotics does not uh, affect the biofilm? It does to what some does? extent, not the biofilm itself, no. Because the biofilm itself is made of sugar and protein, whereas it, those antibiotics have specific targets in a cell. Yeah. Now, fungal infections. Let's talk about fungal infection. If you get a fungal infection like ringworm or something like that, you need to use different ointments or you need, you need to use creams and ointments to try to treat it. But the problem, the problem is that fungi are kind of very similar to us. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Are fungi eukaryotic? Yes. Are you eukaryotic? Yeah. And so if you're eukaryotic and fungi are eukaryotic, do our proteins and organelles kind of look similar and function in a similar way? And if that's true, if I have a drug that binds to their protein, might it also maybe cross talk with one of my proteins that's similar because we're more related, right? Evolutionarily speaking, right? You see what I'm saying? So do you think it's easier to treat fungal infections or harder to treat fungal? It's harder because they're so similar to us. It's hard to find drugs that specifically bind to a fungal uh, enzyme but don't bind to one of our enzymes, right? Does that make sense? Whereas with bacteria, bacteria are prokaryotes. My gosh, they have a cell wall. We don't even have a cell wall, right? So if we, if we could throw all kinds of things at their cell wall, we don't even have a cell wall, right? So it's a lot easier to find good drugs against bacteria because they're so distantly related to us. They're going to have enzymes that look nothing like our enzymes, you know, and we're going to find way better drugs with higher therapeutic index. Remember therapeutic index, the difference between the amount that's potent and the amount that's toxic, right? Does that make sense? Well, with fungi, antifungals, the therapeutic index is always smaller, right? The therapeutic index is smaller. That means the amount it takes to treat the infection is always pretty close to the amount that's toxic to you, right? Does that make sense? As, you know, if you've ever had a fungal infection in the past, you've noticed that it was pretty, you know, big pain to get rid of it, right? It didn't just clear like in a day and it was great. It was harder, right? You had to treat it and then make sure to keep treating it. And then sometimes it would irritate your skin or, you know, 
And hopefully you didn't have a systemic fungal infection. You know, systemic means like in your body, in your lungs, growing it from your lungs into your body. That's called a systemic fungal infection. And those are even harder to treat, right? Because again, they are eukaryotes, you're eukaryotes. Drugs that impact them are gonna probably impact to you to some extent. So it's very difficult to treat fungal infections. And now you know why. It's because of the similarities to us. Can you use antibacterial drugs, antibiotics, to kill fungi? No. Antibiotics are designed for bacteria. I want you to at least take this away, if nothing else. Antibiotics for ba bacteria, antifungals for fungi, right? Antivirals for viruses, right? So you got to take the right treatment for the right infection, right? Here are some common fungal treatments, but you obviously you don't need to memorize any of these. They're just here, so you can take a look at this table. What about protozoa and helminths? You know, you can get protozoal infections, right? We saw trypanosoma growing among your red blood cells. It can get in and cause a blood infection. Remember trypanosoma? What about plasmodium? We saw that. It grows in your red blood cells. Remember, plasmodium grows inside of your red blood cells. Trypanosoma grow among your red blood cells. Well, what happens when you're infected with those? Can you just take an antibiotic? No. Again, in this case, you need antiprotozoal, or if it's a worm infection, anti-helminth right? pills as well. So there are anti-malarial drugs, for instance. What do you think those kill? Malaria parasite. The malaria parasite called? Mm -hmm. Called? Plasmodium. Pl plasmodium. Yeah, plasmodium, right? So if I take quinine, this is a drug against, yeah, for malaria, yeah, to kill the plasmodium. Right? See, you need to, you need to, Take the right drug for the right in, for the right infection, right? And this is this it, it's more common than you think. You know, people still to this day they get the sniffles or they have one problem and then they go demanding antibiotics, right? And you know, they they get very up in arms if you don't give them antibiotics and you try to educate them that what they have is a common cold or they have the flu, and the antibiotics are not going to help them because what's causing their sniffles has nothing to do with bacteria. You know, and what's the danger in giving them antibiotics when their symptoms are not caused by bacteria? What's the danger in that? It can become resistant, right? The more you prescribe antibiotics when they're not needed, the more likely the organisms are to become resistant, right? And that's one of the big problems with over-prescribing antibiotics is that it leads to drug resistance. So if you're wondering, how come 30 years ago, you know, these antibiotics were really, really effective and now all these organisms seem to be resistant? It was because they became resistant. They, 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 they adapted. And the reason they adapted is because of the overuse of the antibiotics, right? All right. And of course, there's also anti helminthic drugs. So, you know, if you have a tapeworm or you have hookworm or you have a fluke, a liver fluke, a blood fluke, right, all of these have appropriate medicines that help clear that infection. Okay. Now let's talk about viruses. For a viral infection, you need an antiviral drug. Okay, you can't take antibiotics. But here's the thing about antiviral drugs. They don't typically completely cure you of the disease. Okay, what antiviral drugs are good at doing 
is slowing down the replication cycle. Do you guys remember what the replication cycle is? Adsorption, entry, you know, with penetration, uncoding, uh, synthesis, assembly, and release. Remember all that? Well, that happens at a pretty quick rate normally, right? That happens pretty quickly, that cycle. What antiviral drugs do is they just slow down that cycle. They make it really slow. You know why? Because this drug binds to this part, this drug binds to another part, and that's called a cocktail of different drugs. Usually with viruses, you'll find cocktails of, of drugs. One drug might stick to the viral spike protein, right? One drug may stick to a different viral protein, like a uh, polymerase or something like that. Does that make sense? Now imagine, if different drugs are sticking to different viral components, that's going to slow down the viral replication. But does that necessarily cure you? No, it simply slows down the viral replication, right? That doesn't mean that no antiviral drugs can possibly cure you, you know, but uh, usually if you do get cured, it's because you cured yourself, right? Your body was able to clear the infection, right? And by taking the antiviral, you just slowed it down to where, you know, you gave your body a good chance to catch up and clear it before, you know, you became too sick, right? So HIV is a big example of a, you know, an infection that your body cannot clear, okay? Your body cannot clear, but there's very good antivirals. And it's not just one drug, by the way. It's a cocktail of different drugs. Cocktail means different drugs in one, okay? And what do we know about the drugs? What do the drugs, what does each drug do? What does each drug do? Each drug is a small molecule that does what? Yeah, binds to a specific protein or enzyme, and it just stops it from working properly, right? So if I t have the HIV cocktail, one drug, what does it seem to be interfering with on the HIV molecule? How about the spike proteins, right? One drug binds to the spike proteins. What would that disrupt? How about adsorption, right? If the drug's binding to the spike proteins, what can the spike proteins not bind to? Your cells, right? It can't bind to the receptors on your cells, right? So imagine, would that slow down the virus? Yeah, because the drug is binding to the spike proteins. Now the spike protein can't bind to your cells. Well, then that's slowing down the infection, right? Okay. Um, let me show you some more HIV ones. So again, one drug binds to the spike protein. Another drug binds to HIV's reverse transcriptase. Do you remember, what does this enzyme do, reverse transcriptase, for HIV? Yeah, it converts the RNA genome to DNA. That's why it's called a retrovirus, remember? Because what does HIV do the second it gets inside of your cell? It converts its RNA genome to a DNA genome, right? Well, guess what? One of those drugs in the cocktail is binding to this enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So now, reverse transcriptase can't convert the RNA genome to DNA. So you see, that's two, two, two places where we've slowed down HIV, right? One drug stuck to what? the spike proteins, preventing the HIV from sticking to your cell, right? Then even if, even if it did stick to your cell, now another drug is binding to reverse transcriptase, preventing it from converting the RNA to DNA, right? So that's slowing down the virus too, right? What about, um, it's not written here, but, there's other enzymes that HIV needs too. Here, did you know HIV also needs this enzyme called protease? 
this enzyme protease finalizes the HIV proteins. Without, without this enzyme, HIV can't finalize its proteins, right? It can't, it can't finalize synthesis, you know what I mean? So what does one of the drugs do in the cocktail? It inhibits the protease, right? So now the HIV can't finish synthesis, you know, the synthesis part of its cycle, right? Its um, replication cycle, right? Um, also, insert into, yeah. And then there's another one that's not written here, but there is another enzyme that HIV has called integrase. Integrase. I wonder if that's on the next slide or not. No. Do you see integrase here? They might have left it out. But there's another enzyme that HIV has called integrase. Do you know what integrase does? Anyone? Perfect. Yeah. Integrase is the HIV enzyme that integrates its genome into your genome. It's without integrase, HIV can't copy and paste, you know, put its genome into your genome, right? Does that make sense? And one of the drugs in the cocktail, the HIV cocktail, binds to integrase. So now it can't integrate its genome into your genome. So you see how this cocktail works? One drug is binding to the spike proteins, one drug's binding to the reverse transcriptase, one drug's binding to the protease, one drug's binding to the integrase. And if you're taking a, a mixture of all of these, right, well, anything the HIV is trying to do is slowed down, right? Everywhere it turns, it's blocked, it's slowed down, it's blocked, it's slowed down. But does that mean you're cured? That doesn't mean you're cured, but it slows it down so remarkably well that it's clear in tests. Like you could go and take a HIV test and it doesn't show up. You know, that's how much these drugs are slowing down the virus. Isn't that amazing? So, but unfortunately, if you were to stop taking those drugs, or you stop taking that regimen, then it would speed up again, right? Because you didn't actually clear the virus, right? You just slowed it down so incredibly much that it became untraceable. Isn't that interesting, right? Cannot be cured completely. There is a way to cure HIV completely, but it's not, it's not a way that's safe or recommended. It's by doing a bone marrow transplant with mm. mutant donors. And I can explain how that works if you want. It's pretty interesting, actually. So let me explain that real quick, and then we'll head off to, to lab. So on the surface of your cells, on the surface of your cells, this is a helper, helper T cell. A helper T cell. On the surface, there is CD4, as well as what's called CCR5. You know what these are? Remember when I said that viruses bind to receptors on, on your cells, right? Well, CD4 and CCR5 are the receptors on your cells, right? You see what I'm saying? And they're the ones that are recognized by, you know, if this is HIV, HIV has spikes, right? HIV has spikes, and they recognize CD4 and CCR5, right? You follow me so far? So if you have HIV, then it's, it's adsorption. It's attaching to your helper T cells by binding to these two receptors on your surface of your cell, right? So one thing you could do if you want to be cured of HIV and it actually, it, they've done it in certain patients. There's a, a guy called Timothy Ray Brown. He's, a, he's called the Berlin patient. And what happened was he had lymphoma and HIV at the same time. You know what that means? So he had HIV, but he also had lymphoma. What's lymphoma? Yeah, what is lymphoma? Cancer of the lymphocytes, like T cells. So he had... He had cancer of these T cells. That means his body was making way too many T cells. So he was going to die from the lymphoma, right? 
not the HIV infection, but the lymphoma was going to kill him, right? So how do you treat, how do you treat uh, le leukemia? How do you treat that? Or lymphoma? How do you, how do you treat it? Anyone know? Do you, anyone know how you treat lymphoma? Yeah, bone marrow transplant. Bone marrow transplant. Where do your where do your T cells come from? Do you guys know? Where do they originally come from? The bone marrow. Stem cells in the bone marrow, right? Does that make sense? So what they do is they obliterate your stem cells. They kill your stem cells. So your stem cells can no longer make white blood cells, right? So your body can literally not make any more white blood cells. Then they take a donor's stem cells from a donor, a donor's bone marrow, right? And then they inject you with that bone marrow. And now that bone marrow has the stem cells to make more helper T cells. But guess what? You have to make sure that the donor is a mutant. It's called Delta 32, right? It's a mutated CCR5 that looks different. Look. The CCR5 on these donor uh, white blood cells looks different because they're mutants, right? Now, are you making your own T cells anymore? No, because no, they killed your, your stem cells. They, they killed your bone marrow, right? Now you're making T cells from a donor stem cells that they donated to you. And those donate donor stem cells, they cured your lymphoma, by the way because now you're making these, these T cells at a normal pace. They cured your lymphoma. But also, what else did they cure? Your HIV, because now can HIV bind if you have a weird looking CCR5? No, because the CCR5 looks different. So HIV can't bind to it, right? So now that patient, it's a real patient, look him up, he's called the Berlin patient. He was cured for lymphoma and HIV in one procedure, right? Isn't that interesting? But that's not a good cure for HIV because the, the, you know, having a bone marrow transplant always has a pretty high risk of death. Does that make sense? So bone marrow transplant is not safe. You no, know, it's not safe. They do it if you're gonna die, right? You're gonna die, bone marrow transplant, right? If you just have HIV and no lymphoma, is it worth doing a bone marrow transplant to try to cure it? No, because as long as you take your pills, you're safe, right? Does that make sense? So that's the only cure for HIV at the moment, is getting a bone marrow transplant from a mutant donor who's resistant to your strain of HIV, right? So that's how it works. Remember that microorganisms, they can become drug resistant they could become resistant to all kinds of different antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand how this works. There are two ways that microbes are drug resistant, either intrinsically or acquired. Intrinsic makes sense because if a bacteria makes an antibiotic, then it has to be intrinsically resistant to that antibiotic. That makes sense, right? For, for example, if you're a member of the genus Bacillus or Streptomyces, remember those are the two genuses that make antibiotics, well then you need to be intrinsically, intrinsically, naturally resistant to those antibiotics. Otherwise, you need to have acquired, uh, acquired resistance to those antibiotics. Acquired means resistance, bacterial resistance to a drug in which they were previously sensitive. So this could happen a number of different ways. We're going to talk about how you can acquire drug resistance. One way is through spontaneous mutation. Remember what I said drugs are? Drugs are small molecules that bind to a specific protein or the ribosome or some specific target and block its function, right? Well, what if the ribosome gets mutated? What if the drug target, what if the target of the drug gets mutated and it changes shape a little bit, right? That protein now looks different. So the drug may no longer bind 
to that protein. Does that make sense? So if you, if the bacteria mutates the protein, right, by mutating the gene, then that could alter the drug target. So the more mutations that happen, the more likely it is for microbes to become drug resistant. What else? How about horizontal gene transfer? Remember HGT, horizontal gene transfer? You can have conjugation, you can have transduction and transformation. All of those are ways that you can acquire immunity, right? If I, if I acquire a gene that makes me resistant to penicillin through any one of those different ways, right, those horizontal gene transfer mechanisms, then I'm now resistant to that, to that antibiotic, right? So horizontal gene transfer. Okay. Here's another way that microorganisms can become drug resistant. They could, they could uh, inactivate the drug. They can inactivate the drug. So do you guys remember last time I told you about penicillinase? Penicillinase, that's the enzyme that cuts the beta-lactam ring of penicillin, right? Well, that's an example of inactivating the drug, right? Microorganisms that produce penicillinase, they inactivate penicillin by cleaving penicillin's beta-lactam ring. Okay. Here's another mechanism of drug action, like how microorganisms become resistant to drugs. They could limit the permeability to the drug. They could prevent the drug from even entering the cell. Okay. Or they could even eject the drug once it enters the cell. This is called efflux, right? So imagine if you prevent the drug from even entering the cell, or if you could pump the drug back out immediately when it enters the cell, then you're going to become resistant to that drug. Think about, think about uh, acid fast bacterium, right? Acid fast bacterium with those mycolic acid waxy layer. That makes it very difficult for drugs to enter through the cell membrane into the cell. Okay. Okay. Again, if you mutate the drug target, if my, if my ribosome gets mutated, if a protein gets mutated, this could lower the binding affinity for the drug to the target, and this could lead to drug resistance. Another way that microorganisms can become drug resistant is if they find an alternative pathway to the, to the one that's being shut down. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Do you guys remember the sulfa drugs, sulfonamide I told you about last time? Sulfa drugs compete for folic acid production, right? Sulfa drugs prevented folic acid production. Well, what if, what if the microorganism had a different way of getting a hold of folic acid? Would that solve the problem? That would solve your problem, right? So that's called an alternate pathway. So the sulfa drug prevented the microbe from making folic acid in one pathway but the organism found a different pathway to make the same folic acid. So in that case, it negates the power of that antibiotic. You see what I'm saying? That's what they mean by using an alternative pathway. And how does this, you know, natural, how does this work? How does drug resistance work? It, again, a big contributor of drug resistance is mutations, right? And mutations can drive these new adaptations that form, these new drug resistant strains that can pop up. And this is as a consequence of natural selection. So any large population, and you know bacteria form large populations of billions of cells, 
any large population of microbes is likely to contain a few individual cells that are naturally drug resistant due to mutations. If the drug is not present in the population, then the number of these resistant microbes will remain low. That makes sense. But if the population is exposed to a drug, what happens? The drug starts killing all the sensitive and susceptible microbes, right? But who does it leave? Who does it? It leaves the most resistant ones behind, right? So it's like you're selecting for the most resistant microorganisms. You see how it works? You have a population of billions of E. coli. You, you administer some kind of antibiotic. Guess what? The antibiotic's going to start killing the most susceptible E. coli first. And it's going to kill the least susceptible E. coli last. Right? And that's what we mean by you know, so natural selection. The drug is the selective agent that's killing all of these susceptible microorganisms, but leaving behind sometimes the least susceptible microorganisms. Does that make sense? And isn't that a way of selecting for mutants? It's a way of selecting for resistant bacterium? Because guess who it's going to repopulate? The most resistant ones that are left. They're the ones that are going to repopulate and grow and become many. That's not good. So you see how, do you see how, you know, overuse of antibiotics is bad, right? Prescribing antibiotics all the time for everything is bad because the more you prescribe, the more you kill off the most sensitive bacterium, and the more you give a chance for the most resistant ones to survive and repopulate and explode in numbers, right? This is how drug resistance forms due to mutation, right? Especially if you don't take your entire course of antibiotics. You know, when they say take the antibiotics for two weeks, right? What do people do? They just take it for one week till they feel better, and then they just say, well, I feel better, so I'm not going to keep taking these. And they put it in the pantry or something, right? They don't take any more. Well, guess what you just did? You killed off 99.9% .9 of the bacteria, but that 0.1% that's left, those are the most resistant little guys, and they're still in your body, right? So if you get infected again, it's going to be much harder to treat, and you've contributed to you know, these resistant bacteria growing in numbers, right? You don't want to keep killing off the easiest, you know, microorganisms and keep letting off the hook the most resistant ones. And that's what that's what is the problem with modern medicine is, you know, people demand antibiotics for everything, even if they have a cold which is due to a virus or a flu which is due to the virus or covid which is due to a virus. You know, that is not a t case where you typically need antibiotics, but you take the antibiotics, again, it kills the most susceptible microbes. Okay, here you can see what I'm talking about, how antibiotic resistance happens. Here you can see there are lots of bacteria with just a couple mutants, just spontaneous mutants. These mutants are very resistant to this particular chemical, this particular antibiotic, right? Normally, they're low in the population. But what do we do? We administer that antibiotic, and look what it kills. It kills the most susceptible. It kills the least resistant microorganisms, and it leaves the most resistant microorganisms. And essentially, what you've done is you're selecting for the most resistant ones. So guess what? They take over. They, they're the ones that survived. They're the ones that grow. They're the ones that now become the majority of the bacteria in your body. And every time you expose them to antibiotics, they get even stronger right, and more resistant until they're completely resistant to that antibiotic. Right? And this is how it, how it occurs. And then. Remember, they can share this newfound information with others through 
horizontal gene transfer, right? So transduction, transformation, conjugation. Why not share that new information with a friend, right? And make him resistant to antibiotics too. So you see here, 75% of antimicrobial prescriptions are for throat, sinus, lung, and upper respiratory infections, the majority of which are likely viral and will not benefit from any antibiotics. Okay, you see the problem here? People demand antibiotics from their doctors, and they get really upset if they don't get antibiotics. But they're contributing to this problem. They're contributing to the resistance problem. Because as we know from this chapter, antibiotics do not treat viral infections. They could treat secondary infections that could occur if you have the flu. Sometimes if you have the flu, you could come down with a secondary bacterial infection. That's true, but normally, you know, uh, antibiotics will not help you in any way with a viral infection. And then obviously in the, in the hospital, there are constantly patients on antibiotics. And these are people who are on antibiotics. They have weakened defenses, weakened immune systems. And so we need to you know, watch out for spread of C. diff and other highly resistant pathogens that can spread. Okay. And you can see here the overuse of antibiotics has led to penicillin resistance in nearly 100% of all Staph aureus strains within just 30 years. So 30 years ago, if you took penicillin, it was almost 100% likely to treat your infection. Today, it's almost 100% unlikely to do anything. That's how, how much resistance has spread over the last 30 years only. Can you, so you can imagine what will happen in the next 30 years. Hopefully we don't get, you know, strains that are resistant to everything. Although there already are strains that are pretty much resistant to everything. There are people today, in 2024, there are people who could go to the hospital with a bacterial infection and end up dying because no antibiotic is, you know, is effective anymore. So this is a, they call it a post-antibiotic world right, or era, post-antibiotic era. And we're entering it. You know, when you guys go to clinic, you'll see bacterial infections where they're resorting to removing tissues because antibiotics aren't working anymore. And it's all because of this overuse of antibiotics. Animal feeds, right? Antibiotics are used in animal feeds on the farm, right? Because we don't want infections in the cows and the chickens. But guess what? Again, you're selecting for the most resistant microbes in these animals as well. And if those, if those resistant pathogens are in the chicken, well, they could jump to humans if you, you know, eat the chicken. So again, I told you about this post-antibiotic era where some infections will be untreatable. You know, this is a, you know, imminent threat that researchers are trying to figure out solutions for. In the past, the way we found solutions was finding new drugs, you know, or making new synthetic drugs, or making semi-synthetic drugs, um, custom designing drugs. But nowadays, we have more techniques, a bigger tool belt that we're using. We're trying to use nanomaterials that might kill off the microbe, antisense RNAs for a process known as RNA silencing, CRISPR technology, this is a gene editing technology. Bacteriophage, that's smart, right? Bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. Well, what if, you took a, what if you took a medicine that was bacteriophage? Those bacteriophage would target the bacterial cells and not your cells, right? 
and antibiotics specifically targeting critical gram-negative outer membrane proteins. So this is, this is current research today. This is what they're focusing on because they know that these species of staph and other microbes are becoming more and more and more resistant and we're gonna need some other strategy for killing them off in the future. We're not gonna be able to rely on antibiotics for much longer, unfortunately. It's kind of sad and scary. Because the world was a scary, scary place before antibiotics. Very scary. And now we're heading back to that scary world due to resistance. Now you might be wondering, uh, you know, what are these helpful bacteria in your gut called? They're called probiotics. Probiotics are microorganisms fed to animals and humans to improve intestinal biota. When, whenever you eat yogurt or any of these other products, they're full of living bacteria, lactobacillus and other helpful bacterium, right? These bacteria make their way to your intestines and colon, and they help with digestion. They help take up space, right? They help take up space, which prevents more nefarious microbes like C. diff from taking over the intestines, right? In fact, when, you know, a, a lot of doctors will say, you know, if you're on antibiotics, if they prescribe antibiotics, they might also recommend that you either eat yogurt or take probiotic capsules as well to help replenish some of your natural gut micro microbiota. Now, don't confuse that term with prebiotics. Prebiotics are nutrients that help with the growth of beneficial microbes. Okay, so fructans, for example. These are an example of a prebiotic, a nutrient that you would ingest to help with your gut microbiota, help it you know, grow. Okay. And I already told you about the, the main way to treat C. diff, right? Unfortunately, if you come down with C. diff, it's the fecal transplant that's the most effective treatment for C. diff. Remember, you can't take antibiotics. Well, you can, but antibiotics aren't that effective against C. diff infection because, you know, C. diff, this is a clostridium genus, and clostridium are resistant to antibiotics, you know, because they, they can make endospores, right? So it's hard to treat a C. diff infection with antibiotics. Fecal transplant, unfortunately, is the way to reintroduce those beneficial normal biota. And that's it for chapter 12. We made it through chapter 12. Let's stop there, and then we'll carry on with chapter 13.